Live from New York, it's theCUBE. Covering Inforum 2016, brought to you by Infor. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. Welcome back to New York City, everybody. This is theCUBE, we're here live at the Javits Center. Lee Martin is here, she's the Senior Director of Infor Dynamic Science Labs. Lee, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for having me. So we've heard a lot about this kind of science, cool name, Dynamic Science Lab. Tell us about it. Sure, uh, that's true. On main stage this morning we were mentioned in several areas. Uh, so we are a team of data scientists essentially. We're based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, right near MIT. We recruit heavily from the local schools including MIT and Harvard. We have about uh, 20 uh, scientists in our team today. And they are typically PhDs or masters in operations research, applied math, statistics, those types of areas. Right, so we always, always talk about the cube, about what makes a data scientist, and you mentioned those areas, and, and also just the ability to do, you know, multitask in those areas, and a love of data, and yes. data wrangling, and. Yeah, yeah, so we do, we, we typically start our engagements with customers, um, we, we do that through a proof of concept phase. So if we're developing a new product or we're trying to do a new a science-based enhancement, uh, we work with customers and the first thing we, we want to do is bring in data. So we'll, um, we'll identify a particular problem in an industry that we're trying to solve. We'll speak to a variety of customers. We'll find a few good matches in there where there's a customer that is interested in working with us on a proof of concept and giving us their data. Um, and then we'll, we'll work with them over a series of a few months to um, look at their data, and that's always the first step, right, is getting an understanding of their data. And for us, because we work across, uh, we, we work across all the industries at Infor, we're touching lots of different types of data. So the folks in our team aren't, don't necessarily come with those industry backgrounds, and some of it's learning as we go. So, so getting access to the data is, is a way for us to start understanding that industry. I remember when uh, hearing a story in one of the big data conferences that we were doing, in the early days of the automobile, the, the, the industry elite were concerned that there wouldn't be enough, you know, what, what we now call chauffeurs to drive people around because, you know, the, the people, the way they were transported was somebody would, you know, in a horse and carriage would be driving, right? So there weren't enough chauffeurs to go around. Then they applied that, that little story to data scientists. Like, there's not enough data scientists to go around, so it's a barrier to actually growth in, yeah. in that business. Um, this notion of, you know, data science for the many, the citizen data scientists, all kinds of cliches. Where are we at with that? Is it, a, is it, is it really still a community of just high-powered data scientists? Can we permeate that throughout organizations? It's a good question because there is um, a lot of competition for data scientists out there right now. It's really hard to actually recruit folks um, to come into our team. Uh, and you know, I've, I've been, uh, prior to coming to Infor, I worked at other uh, analytics teams, so I've been around in the industry for, for a while now, and certainly when I first started, uh, data science was sort of a, a little bit more of a, it felt like a niche, a niche field, um, but now it's everywhere, and it's very broad, so when you hear the terms data scientist and big data, um, it actually, people use it in a variety of different ways and in a very broad meaning. So for some people, um, it can mean BI related things. For us, we think of it more of a traditional, really data oriented using um, predictive analytics, using mathematical modeling, optimization forecasts. So, um, you know, new methods and old methods. So forecasting has been around for a long time um, and machine learning is relatively new, you know, sort of in the scale of how people talk about things. So it definitely has grown over time and we really do see um, a big, big competition for it now in terms of recruiting and um, a lot of customers asking for it. So. It definitely has grown. I, I just want to follow up on Dave's question about the demand for data scientists. Um, McKinsey did that study a few years ago, so we're going to be many hundreds of thousands, you know, short. And and if you want, you know, to work with the data scientists, you're going to have to work with us or IBM or, you know, because they're all going to work for us. Mm -hmm. um, how far along are we in using machine learning to help? the data scientists become more productive? Mm -hmm. 
I think machine learning is one of those things we've definitely made progress on. My sense is that it also has become a bit of a buzzword, uh, and so it's, 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 the term is thrown ab around a lot. Um, there are some places where really machine learning is happening. Um, in fact, we have a, a project that we have been working on for the past couple of months uh, that ultimately down the line will use machine learning, but you got to start somewhere, right? You, especially with a, with a customer who's trying to solve a very a, a specific problem, you want to start with solving that problem and then branch out, and maybe machine learning isn't the first thing you bring to the table, um, because it is, it, t it tends to be slightly more um, advanced than some other techniques. So I do think it's being used. I do think you know it's a, it's a great uh, uh, tool to have in your tool belt, um, and and I think it can bring a lot to the industry. But I also think it's you know there's there's a lot of uh, use of the term, and it's not always you know sort of what we think of it as in a more traditional sense. It's, it feels like Inforce trying to be del very deliberate about the dynamic science lab, in that. It's not just theoretical. You're trying mm -hmm. to actually embed it into applications to have a productive outcome. Right. I wonder, I mean, it seems blatantly obvious, but, but it, it, maybe it didn't just happen like that overnight, but can you talk about the intent yeah. and how you're actually purposefully driving innovation through your products, ultimately to your customer? Mm -hmm. Right, so when Duncan introduced Dynamic Science Labs back in New Orleans, he was talking about the concept that in four, with its customers has access to such a large amount of such a large amount of data. So if you think of all the data in ERPs and, and the edge apps and other areas that we have, and our customers want to harness that um, that. So we have really spent a lot of time um, understanding where issues exist with customers, so things that they want to uh, really focus on, uh, problems in their business, um, areas that they want to improve on, and really trying to start with those and then building, a, building out a solution uh, from there. So uh, this year we've um, gone live, we've gone GA on three solutions out of our team. Now we're a team of, of 20, we're now 20 folks. Um, you know, so having three solutions out there is very exciting for us, which is probably why you, you know, we were mentioned a lot on main stage uh, today. So we have an inventory intelligence for healthcare solution, we have um, a CRM sales logic solution, and we have pricing science for distribution. So we have other projects beyond that that we are working on, uh, but those are three core solutions that you know we're really excited to have those available here, here today. But they're still in early stages. So in, in all cases, we're sort of you know working with early adopters who are helping us to refine our approaches and our algorithms. Um, but we're, our goal is really to try to help solve those particular problems using science. So, let's take one as an example. Take the CRM sales logic. Mm -hmm. Everybody's you know, familiar with, with CRM, something that resonates. How do you anticipate that, that DSL will differentiate uh, uh, in for and add value for customers mm -hmm. in ways that you know, plain vanilla CRM won't? Yeah, well, so in the case of CRM, I think we are, um, we are bringing, this is the first step. Right, as in a lot of the solutions that we're, we're starting with, um, let's get down some basics and then let's move on to the more complicated things. So I was talking about machine, machine learning before. In the case of um, CRM sales intelligence, we're starting with um, next likely purchase and lead scoring. Now, that's not something that nobody else has. There are solutions out there that have that. But what we really want to do is bring our in for customers um, to advanced to, to the sort of arena of advanced math and science so that eventually we do get ahead of others. Um, but in some case, cases, we're really trying to sort of start with what are the things that customers want today and that's something in the CRM space that they felt like they were missing and so we're able to go in and add that functionality. So in the case of CRM, we're going to build on that and we're going to get more advanced but we have a good solid platform to start with now. And a lot of it too is, is the data itself, the quality of the data, but it's but it starts with the premise, that basically you said Duncan sort of had this premise when, he, when you guys launched this two years ago, of we have a ton of data. Yeah. Are you finding that you've got the right data? And is the quality of that data in a form that is acceptable, or is that a big part of the effort? Yeah. Determining that and wrangling that, or maybe yeah, talk about certainly, that a little bit. Yeah, certainly um, managing data is a really, um, and cleaning data for the purposes that we need to use it for is, 
is really difficult. So um, we do spend a lot of time uh, with customers and, and oftentimes we'll go visit with customers who want to do a project and their question isn't actually, well, can, can we work with you on a project? Their question is, what data do I need to start thinking about now for this project that I want to do in the future? So that's in particular when you think about IoT, um, that is a really hot question that we get from people is, um, you know, sort of what, what kind of, uh, um, things should I be gathering around IOT and thinking about in terms of IOT so that you have something to analyze down the road? Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to get back to this question of how much data and is it an advantage? And by way of uh, relaying a, a, a something I heard from the, one of the leading AI researchers at Stanford where she became part of uh, Toyota's uh, autonomous driving program. Mm -hmm. I mean, she isn't, she isn't going to work for them, but she's part of their funded institute. She said she thought they would be a leader because um, you just put cameras and sensors on Toyota cars, they'll have more data than just about anyone else. Mm -hmm. And so my question then, taking that to, to, to um, Lawson, uh, or Infor, is will you have, let's say, for, from the CRM data, will you have more data that's relevant for this next best offer than anyone else, mm -hmm. or you know, understanding that more data is more important than better algorithms. Yeah. How do you make that advantage yours? Yeah, so I am a fan of the idea of knowing where you're going before you start down the data science path. I mean, I, I think, I sort of think of it, there's two ways you can go. You can sort of say, here's all my data, go see if you can find something interesting. And the other thing is, here's this problem I'm trying to solve, analyze this data, and let's see if we can answer the, answer the question. So, I think most of our work falls in the second camp of, you know, what's the business problem you're trying to solve, and do you have the data to support that? This other path is very valuable, but it's much, um, it's more, it's longer, it's much more expensive, it's more time intensive to do. And, but I think, I, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, if you know you want to go after this next best offer or something equivalent, do you compare your, the data you are likely to be able to bring to bear on that um, modeling exercise, do you compare that with competitors on the assumption that the more data, the better, you know, that someone who has a big data advantage is has, uh, you know, even if they have inferior, algor inferior algorithms, you know, they will probably have an advantage. It's mm, a fair question. Um, I do think that um, at the out start, at the, the start, you're probably, you know, you have a smaller data set perhaps because you're trying to answer this very specific question. Um, but I do think the advantage of Infor is that if you have a suite of Infor products, and you know you see down the road that you're able to pull in that the data from those various products then you have the ability to look across all of those products oh, so and you start to get a bigger picture of things so have more context exactly so i think to start with you know we're trying to solve specific problems and we often know or we find out during the proof of concept phase what the data is to solve that problem uh, but I do think down the road we would, you know, we can take in data from all those different Infor applications and combine it and find interesting things um, that customers today can't do and especially if you're using solutions from lots of different vendors, it will be hard to get to the point where you can put all that data together. That's the advantage about Infor is if you have all these, these, uh, these solutions, you have the opportunity to bring that data together get value out of the existing data. There's nothing exactly. to stop you in the future from bringing in out external data sources and exactly. leveraging all the API you know, that are out there, but yeah. you want to start with what you've got. Start with what we have, exactly. The data that our customers have today is the best and easiest thing to get at, so. So are you prioritizing which are the problems that you'll probably be most successful with based on the, the primary data and the context, or or do customers come to you and say, these are the highest value problems? Yeah, it's a combination um, of us talking to customers um, and saying what, so inventory intelligence for healthcare, for example, um, the, the senior scientist who designed that solution, Don Rose, she and I spent six months when we first joined Infor two years ago uh, and speaking with a whole bunch of Lawson customers to understand 
all the challenges that they have, things they'd like to see or like to work on, and we came up with this whole list of things. Uh, and we decided inventory optimization was a good place to start because we had some experience there from our retail, ex prior retail experience, and so we could bring some knowledge to that space even though neither of us were healthcare experts. Okay. Um, so. Excellent, so, okay, so, um, I guess you guys do inform every two years, right? I'm waiting for the, the annual, but, but that's cool. <laughs> so it gives you enough time to sort of, you know, introduce things and then bake them out. And so we're seeing a lot of progress from New Orleans. So okay, so at, at, at Inform 18, mm. what should we be looking for yeah. for DSL? Well, I know the announcement came out today about IOT, um, mm. and I think we are not the, the, the sole group thinking about IOT at Infor, but it's certainly an area that will be interesting for us down the line once um, we you know, start working with, with customers who have some IOT data. Um, I think RFID, we're, we're talking to customers about RFID projects and um, you know, similar to IOT, how can you use our, our RFID information. Um, we talked about, um, I think, the network aspect of things. So mm -hmm. we are, in fact, working with GT Nexus right now. Um, it was sort of a subtle, it was sort of a subtlety of the presentation um, today on main stage, but we are doing a proof of concept with them around um, ETAs. So being better able to forecast when an item will, you know, leave one continent and arrive at the other continent. So it's a first step of our working relationship with them, but we are going to um, be working with them on a roadmap to, to move beyond that, and so I think we'll, we'll, we'll see even more advanced uh, projects going on around network and GT Nexus. And are there any natural uh, in industry affinities that you're finding? So one of the great things about our team is the fact that we work across industries, right? So there's a lot of science going on at Infor, not just in Dynamic Science Labs. We, we, we happen to you know, get a lot of mention on main stage, but there's a lot of science going on outside of just our team. And there is the ability to um, take one concept and bring it to another area. So um, you know, whether we can take inventory optimization for healthcare and modify that to do spare parts optimization, um, in manufacturing or distribution, we definitely see those kinds mm. of opportunities down the road. Um, Dave, you better take one more because in okay. the- Okay, <laughs> we, we, we're out of time, so oh. if you want to get one more in, now's your chance, all right, we, we, got, we got to wrap. Last <laughs> thoughts, Lee, on, uh, on Inform 16, some of the things the customers are talking about. And yeah. The college, what's the reaction been to yeah. Dynamic Science Labs? Well, I was really pleased to see that uh, we had a session immediately after the main stage this morning, and we had a full house, um, we had some people standing in the background, so I think you know it's really exciting, like I said, to have these three solutions out there, have our team be mentioned on main stage, being able to really do some good work with our customers. Uh, we have several customers here presenting this week about the work we've done with them, so that's great to see, and we're really excited about the next steps. Great, all right, well thanks Lee for coming on theCUBE. All right, we're thanks for having it. me. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest right after this brief break. <laughs>